Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, today we're talking about the magic of surrender, courage, and truth with Coot Blackson. Let's go. Welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle, with over a million downloads and counting. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified coach, a midlife mentor, and I am so glad to be here with you again. I can't wait to introduce you to my guest today. He's one of the few male guests on the Women in the Middle podcast, and when I heard about his book, I knew I wanted to have him on because it's highly relatable. And his message is something you're really going to want to hear. Okay, but just quick, I want to make sure you also know about the new opportunity I have for you with my new sister podcast called Women in the Middle Entrepreneurs. I'm currently looking for guests. So if you're a woman in the middle who's 50 plus and also an entrepreneur or business owner who's actively dealing with navigating around and through classic midlife related obstacles and challenges while you're trying to run your business, then this new podcast is especially for you. So if you're interested in learning more about how to be a guest, head over to www.midlifeinterviews.com and apply. There's lots more information there so you can see if you're a good fit for this show. Okay, now let's dive into this episode. This week, we're talking about the magic of surrender, courage, and truth with special guest, Coot Blackson. Coot is someone who believes that it takes true courage to tell yourself the truth. And if you think about your own life, I'm sure you'll be able to relate to this. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about my guest. Coop Laxon is a beloved inspirational speaker and transformational teacher. He speaks at countless events that he organizes around the world, as well as outside events, including AFEST, Young Presidents Organization, and Entrepreneurs Organization. He's a member of the Transformational Leadership Council, a select group of 100 of the world's foremost authorities in the personal development industry. Winner of the 2019 Unity New Thought Walden Award, Hood is widely considered a next-generation leader in the field of personal development. He's also the author of The Magic of Surrender, Finding the Courage to Let Go, a life-changing book that teaches you how to harness the power of surrender to live your highest purpose. Coop Laxon's mission is simple, to awaken and inspire people across the planet to access inner freedom, live authentically, and fulfill their true life's purpose. I can't wait for you to hear his unique story and message. It is so powerful. So please enjoy this episode. Hi there. We are so excited to have a special guest here today, Coot Blackson who is joining us. Thanks so much for coming on today, an honorary woman in the middle. We don't often have Uh, men. Thanks for having me. So as I said in the introduction, you certainly come with a lot of experience, and I was very excited to have you on because we haven't really talked a lot about what your book is about, which is surrendering. And we're definitely going to get into that. But the way I really love to start these interviews is a little bit about you and your personal journey and how you came to do what you're doing now. So take it away. Sure. Um, I was born in Ghana, West Africa. My father's from Ghana. My mother's Japanese. I grew up in London. I've been living in the U.S. since I was 18. And so I feel like I'm from everywhere and nowhere, a citizen of the world. So that's been a huge blessing. You know, as a young boy, how I started, I would say as a young boy, I was always a very empathetic kid. And so I would feel people suffering very deeply. And there was always a part of me that wanted to alleviate suffering in some way. And I don't think I knew what to do and how to do that. But um, I thought I had a pretty ordinary childhood. Many folks felt like I did not have an ordinary childhood, but I thought my childhood was literally like everyone else's. My first memories as a young boy was seeing a crippled woman crawling on the floor. She picks up the sand, the gravel that this man walks on, wipes it on her face and stands up like a miracle, so to speak. Uh, I grew up seeing blind people see. This is like week after week. Blind people see and deaf people hear and people stand up out of wheelchairs. And 
the same man who's saying she picked up would look at a woman in a wheelchair and say, why are you in this wheelchair? You're not sick, stand up. And so this man was my father. He built 300 churches in Africa, a huge church in London. And he was a very spiritual, metaphysical, mystical character, an amazing man in his own right. Um, so I grew up in this, this, this environment of possibilities where everything was possible. And this was my, my reality. And that was a huge blessing because it felt very normal. I just didn't know any better. And well, you're uh, right. I, that is, that is not normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the majority <laughs> of people do not grow up like that. <laughs> when I was age eight, I started speaking in my father's churches. So that began my speaking career. When I was 14, I was ordained as a minister. And I was given the mandate to take over my father's spiritual organization. And truth be told, I knew when it was announced to thousands of people that this was not my path. This was not my destiny. This was not my, this was not my purpose. And as much as I wanted to help people, I felt I had a different way of expressing. I just felt a different calling, even though I didn't know what that was. And so, you know, at 14, I think like many of us, um, I allowed my fear uh, in hindsight, to inhibit, to limit my my voice, to limit my truth. And I think many of us, we let fear stop us from living our truth, from being oh, authentic, from 100%. expressing our voice, from yes. being who we really are, from the, the fear of, if you really know who I am, you won't love me. And so we hold back so much of our truth and so much of our gifts. And so at 14, I said nothing. I went along with it. I got ordained. Uh, started serving my father's church and his followers and his congregation. All the while, I went through a tremendous inner conflict and inner turmoil because I knew that something wasn't aligned. I knew that something wasn't true. And uh, it took me about four years to, I would say, muster up the courage to own my truth. Uh, basically, I turned about 17 and a half, 18. I had some decisions to make, which was go to university or what, what, what am I going to do with my life now? And I felt this undeniable calling in my soul to come to America. I wanted to come to America because I was sneaking to my father's office and on his bookshelf were literally thousands of self-help books. And most of the self-help authors lived in Southern California. And so <laughs> yes. my calling was come to America, no. come, come to, specifically Los Angeles, and learn from these people and go into this field. For me, this was a obsession. This was a passion to just try to understand life and figure out who, who am I and why am I here and what's the purpose of life and where do we go and is the purpose of purpose of life just to wake up, make money, make babies, go on vacation, and then die. Like, surely there has to be more to life than this. And so it sounds like was, you had like a midlife crisis at 17. <laughs> I had a, yeah, I had an early life crisis, I would say. Totally. But, I, but I, began, I was always questioning as a kid. And so when I was 17 and a half, I, I realized what I had to do. You know, sometimes I think what your soul guides you to do is not always convenient and doesn't always make sense to your mind. But what I have found through years of my own experience is whenever you follow your truth, whenever you follow your soul, whenever you follow that deeper calling inside that pulls you, that that is undeniable, I believe that you will always end up in the right place at the right time with the right people, even though the route that you take may not be the one that you most expect. And so uh, I decided I knew what I had to do, which was have the conversation with my father and leave everything behind. And so... I looked into my future at 18 and I saw that if I followed the expected path and even if I became successful following the expected path, if I didn't have myself, if I didn't have my integrity, if I didn't have my own sanity, my own peace, then what kind of success is that? And that you can't, you cannot be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not and living someone else's life. And if I start lying to myself now, I will have to keep lying to myself for the rest of my life. And that self-betrayal felt so painful that uh, I decided to speak my truth. And I had the conversation with my father, which was terrifying and I difficult. You know, sometimes people think that when you, when you find your purpose, like the light bulbs come on and the angels <laughs> sing and the unicorns come out and the violins play, I think sometimes when you find your purpose – that's when the difficulties begin. That's when the challenges begin. That's when you have to go through many soul tests in order to 
find yourself so that you can develop and grow into the person that you're destined to become. And so I had the conversation and uh, long story short, um, my father and I, we didn't speak for two years. Uh, it was very difficult, um, but I knew I was on the right track and I ended up winning, literally winning a green card in the green card lottery. Really? And that's what brought me to the US, two suitcases, $800 in my pocket, knew no one in the country, just showed up at 18 following a dream and went and found teachers and mentors and many folks I read about, uh, many folks I didn't know. I studied with them, learned, privileged to learn from them. And then I decided to travel many years later. And I started to travel to Israel, study with rabbis and Thailand, study with monks. And my journeys took me to India. And it was in India that my life really shifted and transformed. And I got I have to, with- I have to pause you here for a second because you've said so much and we'll get right back to India. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> you identified fear as mm-hmm. being something that isn't convenient. And I'm, you know, I I just can't imagine the kind of trust that you had in yourself to Mm. push through at that age. It felt like I didn't have a choice. It felt like I didn't, honestly, it felt like I didn't have a choice. And when I felt the pain of the alternative, the pain, when I projected into my future, age 20, age 30, age 40, age 50, and I saw a life of living a lie, the the feeling of pain mm. of that was so strong, so undeniable that it felt like I didn't have a choice. I think one of the things that stops us as human beings from truly breaking free, one of the things that stops us as human beings from transforming are all the ways we lie to ourselves. Yeah. As human beings, in many ways, we are constantly lying to ourselves for reasons we can get into. But we're constantly lying to ourselves about who we are, what we want, and how we feel. We've been conditioned from childhood to be who we think we need to be in order to get love, validation, and approval, to suppress our feelings and not feel our feelings in order to function and survive. And so we, we learn to lie to ourselves, you know. And so we stay in relationships that we know are not aligned. We work jobs that we hate that we know is not a true, authentic expression of our purpose. And so I really think there is no transformation without truth. And we have to really want to be free more than we want what we have, but we also have to want to be free and happy more than we want what we think we want. And so I think that one of the first places that people can start is the courageous decision to acknowledge and tell themselves the truth. Like I would ask yes. everyone just to sit with, regardless of where you are, what what lies am I telling myself? And just sit with that question. Like, what lies am I telling myself? And it can feel scary sometimes to acknowledge the truth because the fear is, like, I was afraid. My fear was, if I tell the truth, what will be the consequences? And so so many of us were afraid to acknowledge the truth because we're afraid of the consequences, not realizing that in not telling ourselves the truth and lying to ourselves, there are many consequences that we have to live with every single day of our life. The pain, the depression, the emotional pain the physical pain, the ongoing disease, the lack of energy, the, you know, that feeling, that is a consequence of not acknowledging the truth. And so uh, I really believe that just the willingness to tell ourselves the truth can begin to transform our lives. But it can be scary. One thing I would just add, just as a support for people, is sometimes we don't acknowledge the truth because we're afraid of the consequences or we're afraid of what we think the consequences would be. We make up a future fantasy, the negative yeah. future fantasy about the future. And so that paralyzes us. But if we're willing to just take the pressure off of ourselves from taking action, like like just take the pressure off of yourself from having to take action and just acknowledge the truth, that can shift things. So the truth might sound like, you know what? I'm no longer in love. That doesn't mean you have to break up. That doesn't mean you have to get a divorce. It just means you acknowledge the truth and allow the feeling, allow the sensation, allow the truth to start a process inside. It might mean you just acknowledge that, you know, I I actually hate my job. And you don't leave. You you don't have to even make a decision, but you just acknowledge. And that begins a process inside. So I found that the truth begins a process of transformation inside. And if we could just start there, that's... That's a profound starting point. So for me, you're so right. You're so right. 
it felt like I just didn't have a choice. And all I did literally was just, I just told myself the truth. Like, this is not my path. This is not. And for four years, for four years, I tried to rationalize. For four years, I tried to negotiate. And that's what we do. And that's one of the things that sometimes keep up, keeps us stuck. We negotiate. Well, maybe, maybe it's not as bad. Maybe he will change. Maybe, you know, they will shift. If I shift, they maybe. And we keep negotiating until we realize, wait a second, it is what it is. And we have to come into a deeper acceptance with reality. One of the first steps to try to, to really shifting something is you have to accept what is. In accepting what is, that doesn't mean you stay there. That doesn't mean you wallow in it. That doesn't mean you don't, you don't make a different decision, but it's in the acceptance of what is that brings you into relationship with what is that gives you the ability to actually shift it. And so that's where I had to start. That is so powerful. And you're so right by separating it out from the action. Yeah. It, it isn't quite as threatening, but it yes. allows you to want what you want to just yes. accept and hear that voice that's so easy to just, you know, push away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. so the other thing that you, that you said that really struck me was as soon as you made the transition to the States, you knew how important it was to find these teachers yes. in the States and in other countries. And why? Why were you so clear on that? I mean, I know you were so young, but I think that's such a mature, that's such powerful insight, you know? Well, I would love to say it was powerful insight and mature, but <laughs> um, when I think back as a kid, like I was, I became obsessed with, with the self-help books on my father's bookshelf. And so these were my mentors. These books took me into other dimensions and other realities. And I was able to travel as a young kid. I was able to read uh, Creative Visualization by Shakti Gawain. I was able to read Osho. I was able to read Krishnamurti. I was able to read Gene Houston. I was able to read Deepak Chopra. I was able to literally compress like decades into days and travel uh, lifetimes and learn from other people's experiences that had, that had way more experience than me. And even though I think ultimately we do have to learn through experience, I think I was able to, to learn from the, the mistakes that other people made and they became my mentors, you know, indirectly. And so I was clear that I wanted to learn from many of these people. And so when I came to the US, I literally landed with no money and almost no money. And, and I went and found these people basically i wouldn't i literally knocked on the doors of some of these folks and harassed them and i went to the seminars and harassed them and i love this you know, so much <laughs> i went and found bob proctor and harassed him in a seminar basically i went to knock on jack canfield's office door i went to a few folks i, I went to the addresses in the back of the books and it was their houses you know and, and i didn't even know and and so um oh, but but, but so i good. think for, for me the the hunger i had a hunger to learn yeah. i had a hunger to 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 grow i had a hunger to understand and and i think that's a key to transformation too is a profound commitment i ask people what do you want more than anything else what do you want more than anything else because i see that many times we don't transform because deep down we're not really committed we would like to. We would like to have a shift. We would like to have a breakthrough. It would be nice. It would be great if it happened. But to truly shift our conditioning, to truly break through, we have to be committed. We have to truly be committed. And so I ask people, what do you want more than anything else? If I, like, like if I took, if I took your head and put it under water for like a minute, what would you want more than anything else? I have no doubt that everybody listening would want air more than anything. You would want air. You wouldn't care about chocolate. You wouldn't care about Gucci. You wouldn't care about a Lamborghini. You wouldn't care about a million dollars. You wouldn't care about being famous. We would just want to breathe. And I think when we really sincerely, with one pointed attention, want to shift, want are committed to transforming our lives without hesitation, that intention, that intention to shift and transform begins to create 
begins to activate inner resources, begins to, to, to focus us in a very profound way, because many times we don't want to transform. There are often unconscious payoffs for why we don't want to transform. There's a fear of, oh, if I really transform, then what will happen to my relationship? You know, if I really shine my light and transform, then I'm, I might not be able to be around my family or my people anymore because we'll just be too different. And so often unconsciously, we keep ourselves smaller. Often unconsciously, we, we keep ourselves where we are to not shift or transform as a way to keep ourselves safe in, in many ways. But I think when we get clear on that, like, what's my intention? And really focusing on our intention for transformation, that, that's also another key. That's really good. And so I left you in India. So okay. you got to India. Got to India. Tell me about that experience. I could, we could talk with probably fill five podcast episodes with that experience, but I landed in India and I felt called to India. Basically, in a nutshell, I had reached the point in my life where I'd reached the point in my life where things weren't working as a young man. And so I ended up in India as a, I'm not going to say a last resort, but I got into the point where I felt like trying to make life happen from the paradigm of my ego and forcing things just wasn't working anymore. So I basically threw my hands up in the air and I said, universe, I, I, I surrender. I give up. I, I don't know what else to do. And so I'm going to pack my bags, go to India, and I'm not coming back until I find certain answers for myself. I want to know truth for myself. I want to know reality. I want to know who I am. I want to know my purpose. I want to know God. I want to know why I have been put on this planet. I want to know the nature of true happiness. I'm tired of reading books about it. I want to experience it at the depth of my being, and I'm not coming back until I have these answers. And so I broke up with my girlfriend, put everything in storage, ended up in India. I shaved my head, had a backpack and a few pairs of clothes, and I started traveling in search of answers. Literally started traveling on trains and buses and walking and to the Ganges and sat with gurus and mystics and teachers and monks and just, you know, all sorts of people just trying to find the meaning of life, the meaning of my life. And uh, there was, so, uh, you know, there were so many profound awakenings and breakthroughs that happened for me and so many teachers I met along the way. And there was one time when I was climbing the Himalayas and walking up the Himalayas to the source of the Ganges. And I started to get sick and I thought I was dying. I literally thought I was, I thought maybe I'd contracted some disease in India or oh malaria. My God. And I, and I literally thought I was dying. And I was vomiting. I was diarrheaing for eight hours, climbing up the mountain, began hallucinating. And I was so sure I was dying. I said a prayer and I said, I was literally saying goodbye to my parents, reflecting on my life, hallucinating, going in and out of consciousness, crawling up the mountain. And I remember just giving up my life. And it was such a profound moment of just, you know, when you think you're dying, it, it, it brings life into perspective. Mm. When, when, when you feel like you're dying, so many of the things that you thought were important just sort of dissolve and fall away. And I reflected on my life, all of my regrets and all of my mistakes and all of my learnings and on and on and on. And I remember falling asleep that night, um, in a hut in the top of the Himalayas, not expecting to wake up. And then I woke up, kind of surprised that I had woken up. And then a donkey takes me down the mountain. When I got down the mountain, long story short again, when I got down the mountain and I and I was driving off in the taxi, I real I was told that I had altitude sickness. And literally within minutes I was fine. <laughs> but that experience of dying freed me in a profound way. Because in so many ways, as human beings, we hold back and we live in fear, fear of death, fear of what people would think, fear of failure. But when you face your death, it, it frees you of so much. And, and so I felt so like free, like I had already died, you know? Oh, wow, yeah, it's and, crazy. And, and yet I was still here. And so 
that provided a profound shift in my life when I came back to life. And, you know, Rumi, the, the great poet, says, in order to be truly free, you must die before you die. And I think we have to die to who we were. We have to die to our egos. We have to, we have to die to our conditioning. We have to die to our identity because so much of us, we're, we're, we're limited by our identity and who we think we were. Yeah. And so wow. that freed me in such a profound way when I came back. Um, that's when I began, uh, working with people and helping people. I just said, screw it. What, what basically I said, what do I have to lose? If I put myself out there, I've already died. So what do I have to lose? And, and, and I began working with people just one-on-one. I, How I old a guy were you then? You're still quite um, young, right? I, I was, I was 20, maybe 20 years old. I can't, this, I can't this, even this, believe this, this was, this was before, wow. um, you know, because my fear was, Oh, I'm too young. What will people think? I don't have this. I don't have education. I don't, I haven't been to university. There was no coaching certificates back then. Right. But after this experience, I said, you know what? What do I have to lose? You know? And, and yeah. I just, I just began to respond to the need in the moment. And one person, when I came back to the US, I felt so free. I had nothing to show for myself. I had no money. I had no girlfriend. I had no bank account. I literally didn't have anything. But I felt, right. I felt, I felt such a sense of freedom. Wow. A freedom that was an inner experience. You know, we often think we're free, but the moment you take away someone's iPhone, someone's makeup, someone's title, someone's, you know, clothes, then we collapse, you know, and, and we, we don't realize that so much of our sense of self and so much of our sense of confidence and so much of our sense of who we are is based and dependent on these external factors. But the challenge is when our sense of self and identity and freedom and confidence and power is based on external factors, we're actually a slave because everything in the outer world is impermanent. It is transitory. And when we're dependent on these things, then our sense of self-esteem and confidence will also go up and down based on the state and the fluctuation of external factors as well. And so... I felt such a sense of freedom because I didn't have anything and and I felt at peace. And so what happened was people began kind of noticing and coming to me and they said, Hey, what's your deal? You know, you you seem happy. Like, what are you on? Like, what do you do? And, and, And I just literally began responding to the need. And one person kind of began talking to one person and talking to another person, talking to another person, had no idea what I was doing, but as I, as I had a sincere intention to be of service, one day a client came to me and that's when I really kind of began to create my own way of coaching people and working mm. with people. I called it uncoaching and it just emerged out of my own process, my own experience and my, and, and, and the journey I had gone through. And I thought, well, maybe people don't have to go to India and shave their head and lose everything in order to transform. <laughs> so what did I do? And I kind of took people through my own, my own condensed version. Uh, and I called it uncoaching. And that's when life started changing. And one person came, another person came, another person came. People started coming from around the world. Um, and, and, and they started transforming. So would you say, uh, still, I'm just, I'm, I'm really blown away by how young you were at that time. So yeah. you know, were 17, 18, you had this big, thing with your father you had to really trust yourself yes, really and what trust. you were feeling you were out of alignment and now it sounds like you are so in alignment more than you probably have ever been yes you mean when now or or, or back then well now for sure <laughs> yes, yes but back then when you actually had nerve to put yourself out there and take paying clients and yes. work with people formally yes. uh, I, st- had- I started i started for free I just, I just wanted to help people. I just started for free, you know, and and here's the thing. Many times I see that people don't start. We constantly wait for some special moment. We, we wait till we think we're ready. We wait till, till, till we have 7,000 certificates. We, we're constantly postponing, postponing, postponing. But I think every step of the way, 
is part of the is part of the necessary ripening and necessary process. And so, if we stand on the sidelines and wait, we will never develop and grow and evolve and become ready. And and and, and so, I tell people: start where you are with what you have. Start exactly where you are with what you have. And if you just take a step and you begin, you grow and you evolve and you develop. You become more ready. Then you take another step. Then life reveals to you the next step. And you take another step. Life reveals to you the next step. And then you're more ready. And and at each stage of your evolution, you become more ready. Life is able to give you more. Then you're able to live into another level of your purpose. And so in that sense, purpose is evolutionary. And your Mm -hmm. purpose is revealed to you in the process of living life itself. In response to your own readiness, your own consciousness, your own vibration. The challenge is many of us, we're trying to figure our purpose out, figure our life out from, from the sidelines, but we, we don't go through the process and the journey. And it's the journey that prepares us. And it's, and it's being prepared that enables us to handle the destiny and purpose in terms of why we're here. And I so love, me, oh my gosh, you said that so well. And you know, it reminded me, um, I became a coach after 27 years working in uh, health Mm -hmm. education and I got laid off and I was thrown for a loop. It was the year I turned 50. And what happened was after I got certified in everything, I was right at that moment that you describe where I had an urge for more certification. I had an urge to be perfect. I had a fear of visibility. I had a fear of what other people would think of me from, you know, the 27 years of career I had. And I did start working for a year and didn't charge anybody. I just started working, being of service, putting myself out there. And it was such a smart thing to have done. I had no idea how smart it was to continue my growth. Exactly what you're saying, that you can't continue to learn and transform from a place of when you're stagnant. It's just impossible. Mm You know, you said it so well. I love that. And I (laughs) I love that. And my narrative, though, about what I did sometimes is negative. It's like, oh, you were too afraid. So you didn't charge anybody for a whole year. But, you know, with this perspective of how important it was and how it really helped me to grow forward, it's a a new new narrative is required. Yeah. And I and I and I think that that that's most people don't start. And what's important is that you start and you evolve. And I think it's important that, I mean, we could go in different ways in the conversation, but I think it's important that you start and as you go and evolve, you expand. As you expand, you come into a deeper integrity and alignment. As you come into a deeper integrity and alignment, that creates an internal vibration of knowing, which then enables you to feel in integrity in charging. Because you know that you, you are, an, you are living and you are able to facilitate the, the transformation that you say you can. Exactly. And, and so, so yeah. I think each step, uh, and so I see a lot of coaches sort of like they've never done it and they want to charge seven bazillion dollars. Right. But, they, but, but, but they haven't produced the result. So then they feel hesitant to charge and then they feel like, Oh, an imposter because on some level they are. And so, and so. I think when they're able to grow themselves step by step by step by step, then they come into alignment, then they can embody it, and, and then they can stand in the knowing of, yeah, I've done it. I've produced the result. And so every step of the way, not only does the, their impact grow, but the results grow and their income grows in, 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 in sync with the reality of who they've become and the results they've produced in the world. So then they're in true coherence on all levels you know and so i think and I, and i think if someone is listening and they want to be a coach and i've been at this game a long time um i produced a lot of results in the game of coaching and in this field i think what's so important and i think this is something that has been lost over the last 20 years as social media has expanded and grown and evolved is if you're going to be a coach, the first, first foundational core fundamental motivation should be to be of service. To me, this is the foundation because you are dealing with souls. This is not just a client. This is not just a business. You're not just selling a coaching package. Exactly. You're dealing with clients and their evolution. And you have another soul that is entrusting you with their journey. 
and and the process and something you see and the journey you go through and the transformation isn't just something that affects their business and their life, but in a certain sense, the trajectory of their soul's evolution and their children and their children and their next generation. And if you really feel as a coach, the sacred responsibility of what that is, it is profound. And so I yes. think it's so important that as coaches, we, you, we come from the foundation of being of service, first and foremost. That doesn't mean you can't make money. But when you come from service, you're coming from pure intent. And when you come from pure intent to serve, I think then you're coming from the right place. Yeah. And then your capacity and ability to make money is also there because I think money is a, simply a function of being of service and you're being of service when you add value, when you're able to help people solve pain, problems, challenges, their issues that they're going through. And so anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Well, there's so, I can tell there's so many things we could talk about. So at the very beginning, I made mention of your book, yes. The Magic of Surrender. So I absolutely want to talk Let's about that. In. Yeah. So tell me about that because I know the concept of surrender is so mm. easy to mm. misinterpret, mm. Uh, especially for women. So if you could talk to us about why you um, wrote this book, Yes. And why it's such an important concept for us to internalize. I'm very passionate about this book. I'm very passionate, to be honest, about the topic. Um, because I feel as though surrender is the most important thing for us as human beings. To be honest, I feel it's why we're here. It's why we incarnate in, onto this existence to surrender to who we are, to surrender to true reality, to surrender to whatever people believe, the divine, the universe, life itself. And so... I think that surrender is the most important thing that we can do. I feel that surrender is the most powerful thing that we can do. If you look at all of the truly, truly, truly great ones that have existed in our civilization, Jesus, Buddha, Mother Teresa, Mandela, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Bruce Lee, Muhammad Ali. I mean, the list goes on. At some point, they all surrendered themselves to life. They all surrendered themselves to a purpose that was bigger than themselves. And it was in their surrender that these human beings, they, they were able to transcend their own human egos, personalities, limitations, and tap into another dimension of potential and possibility. And that's when life was able to use them and manifest through them because they got themselves out of the way. In that surrender, they, they got themselves out of the way and life used them and miracles happened. And so I think that so, so in terms of the book, this was not the book I thought I was going to write. Hmm. This was not the book I wanted to write. To be honest, in full disclosure, I wanted to write a different kind of book. I had literally hundreds of ideas of a different kind of book I wanted to write. You know, the book I thought would be a bestseller, the book I thought publishers would want, the book I thought would, would build my brand, the book, I, I mean, you know, on right. and on and on. And truth be told, when I looked at my whiteboard, of ideas, none of those felt true and none of those felt right. The only word that stood out for me was the word surrender. And I knew that my soul was calling me. I knew that I was, I knew that there was a book that was seeking to be written and this was the book and I could resist it. And all, you know, I think when we resist, we create suffering for ourselves. I could resist it, but I felt like I was not the one writing the book. There was a there was a book that was seeking to be written, and my job was to simply say yes to it and allow it to come through me. And so wow. I had to surrender to the book about surrender. Let's put it that way. And, <laughs> That's perfect. And and the way, just a, a little maybe background, and then I'll share a bit about surrender. How the book came about, I realized in retrospect. So in 2016, I was on a high after my first book was a bestseller. And I got a phone call letting me know at the end of 2016 that my mother, who I love, she was my everything, um, had stomach cancer. And that was a devastating moment. And so mm. I had every, I was living in LA where I live. My mother lived in London and I began flying back and forth from Los Angeles to London literally every month for a week, for a year. So. One week out of every month to be with her, to take care of her. I would fly there. We'd be in chemo sessions together, hold her hand. I would do whatever I could to take care of her. I had every intention to get her, to heal her, 
to fix her, to get her well. Um, and I soon realized quite painfully and humbly that I, I don't think I'm in control of her journey here. You know, I'm like, I'm trying to force feed her green powders and green juice. Like, I think she has her own journey. And so when I began to let go and surrender to her journey, it transformed everything because then I was just able to be with her and be fully present with her without like trying to force some future idea. I was just with her and every moment with her became sacred and precious because it could be the last moment. And, and so about six months into the process, no, seven months, the doctor said, look, there's, there's, uh, there's nothing else we can do for you. Basically, they, they tell you in a loving way, you know, you're, you're going to die. So get your affairs in order. And I remember tears streaming down my eyes, my face in that moment. Because when you really, for me, when I realized my mother is going to die, yes, I've been accepting it, but the reality is, is hard. It's difficult for those for that sure, have had yeah. loved ones die. It's, it's, it's never an easy thing. And, and I looked my mother in the eyes. And I asked her two things. This is where I realized the surrender book was was planted. The seeds were planted. I looked her in the eyes and I said, uh, are you afraid? And she, this little Japanese woman, she looks me in the eyes and she says, uh, I'm not afraid because I know I'm not this body. And that this body is just a temporary vehicle for my soul. And so even when this body dies, I, I'll be here. You know, what I really am will live on. And so I'll be with you, guiding you. I'm not afraid. And then I looked, I was already like stunned. And I looked my mother in the eyes and I said, is there anything I can do for you that would, I wanted to be a good son. Like, can I do something for you that would make your final days easier? Like, what, what do you need? What do you want? What can I do? And she said, there's nothing I want and there's nothing I need. The only thing I want, the only thing I need is what God wants for my life. It's nothing else. And in that moment, I was so moved. I realized that she wasn't attached to living. She wasn't attached to dying. She was open to the highest unfolding for her soul's evolution and journey. She was, she was surren living surrender. In that moment, like not, not just in a mountaintop or, you know, on a yoga class, like in the face of her mortality and death, she was living surrender. And this is why she was like really at peace. Yeah. And so I think many times we have this misconception that surrender is weak, that surrender is passive. That surrender is waving the white flag. Yeah. That surrender is giving up. That if you surrender, you, you, you'll be a doormat. You'll be a victim. You'll be left behind. You just sit there and do nothing. You're going to be, you know, taken advantage of that. If you surrender, you won't manifest your goals, dreams and desires. And I'm saying, no, if you really understand the true essence of real surrender, like what if you didn't get less in life? But what if you got more, more, more than you could have? imagined and visualized and intended with your own limited human will and capacity. And so part of surrender is a letting go of control, or I should say letting go of the illusion of control because right. we're not really as in control as we think. And I think control is that master addiction. Surrender is when we stop trying to force life to fit our limited idea and manipulate life to fit our limited idea of how we think it should be and who we think we should be and what we think it should be. And so it's that taking the limitations off of life to be open, to be available, so that we are available to the highest unfolding of what life is seeking to express. And so I think this is the real essence of surrender. You know, the old paradigm is all about the sort of ego-based model, ego-based way of creating life, make it happen, manifest your goals. No, like get clear on what you want. The thing is, what I found is you might manifest what you wanted or thought you wanted, only to realize that what you thought you wanted was not what you really wanted. It was just what you thought you wanted based on who you thought you were. And, right. and, and so manifesting from the sort of mind or the ego, it, it works, but it's limiting. It, yeah, exactly. And, and I think... Part of surrender is 
It's not that you can't manifest. It's, it's in fact, when, when you ask a different question, the question becomes not what, what do I want? The question becomes, what is it that life is seeking to express through me? What is it that the universe is seeking to express? What is my soul seeking to express? What is the deepest truth, the deepest expression, the deepest impulse that, that my soul is seeking to express and manifest through me and to attune to that, to listen to that, to align with that and, and surrender to that which is seeking to express. If you look at Gandhi, if you look at Mandela, if you know, if you look at Mother Teresa, they surrendered themselves to that. And that's when you can align your thoughts, your actions, your strategy, your resources, your marketing with what's aligned. Then you go 100%, give 100%. So it doesn't mean you sit down, do nothing. You give 100% in the flow of what is aligned. Me all the whilst not being attached to the outcome. And when we get so attached to the outcome, we don't realize in so many ways we end up limiting life. Like it's got to be this. It's got to be this person. It's got to be this. This is, this is, this is how it has to look. And when we, when we, when we surrender, we give a hundred percent, but we're also available. We're also open. And it's the openness to allow life to lead us. It's the openness to allow the curiosity to, 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 to go into the unknown. That is really what surrender is about. And so anyway, that, that's the essence of, of the book. Oh, that is, that's beautiful. And I really appreciating, just appreciate the way you put context and perspective on it, uh, because it can feel really limited and negative, like yes, you said, yes. but this openness and curiosity and detaching from outcomes like that, that, that's mm-hmm. just, that's just beautiful. So please tell us how can we find the book? Ah, yeah, the book can be found. It's pretty simple. Amazon, uh, go to Amazon, get the paperback version, which is out. Uh, the magic of surrender, Amazon paperback. Check it out there. If people want to find out more about my work, they can go to my website, coopblackson.com, K-U-T-E-B-L-A-C-K-S-O-N. Uh, my schedule's there. Instagram, Coop Blackson, Facebook, Coop Love Now. If people are inspired by the conversation, uh, maybe want to dive deeper twice a year. I do a 12-day deep dive transformational event in Bali, of all places, where I take a a small group, 18 people, to Bali, and we transform. And so maybe you feel a calling to make a difference or a readiness to transform. You can find out more at uh, www.boundlessblissbali.com, boundlessblissbali.com. And the next journey is July the 28th. 2023. 2023. This is my last year doing these journeys. Oh, so wow. I've done, uh, I've done 20 of these journeys since 2011. And so this is the last year of doing this particular journey. Wow. Coot, thank you so much. I'm going to put you. all of those links in the show notes. Thanks for having it was me. an absolute honor and pleasure to talk to you today. You've really added so much, uh, for the listeners to think to and. Uh, think about, and I'm going to get this book immediately. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. All the best. Okay, that's it for this episode. Coop Laxon's story is so unique. One thing that really stood out from this interview for me was his drive and passion at such a young age. And you probably heard that in my voice at the beginning of the interview. It was so impressive, especially when he described going to the back of his mentor's books, like, you know, paging through looking at the back and finding those addresses and contact information, and then showing up on their doorsteps to meet them. (laughs) Also, his perspective and framing of the concept of surrender was so great to hear. It was something I'll never forget. You know, we all use the language about the importance of being your authentic self. It's really become part of pop culture. But when you dig in and really think about what it means, he added so much to that by talking about having the courage to tell yourself the truth. And by doing so, recognizing that you don't have to take immediate action, but it's the knowing, knowing what those answers are. That's what's critical to growth and truly knowing who you really are. So good. So I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Okay, now, as you know, this podcast is all about how to love your life again after 50. It's really all about coaching you to be more intentional and to incorporate mindfulness into your life as a regular practice. And mindfulness really is the key ingredient to regret-proofing your life. 
This is how you put yourself on your agenda. My focus as your midlife coach is to help you get unstuck, clear, and focused on your current values and priorities so that you don't have regrets. You can absolutely create less busy and more balance. The bottom line is that you know you're meant for more and you don't want to waste valuable time. Who does? So if you're ready to make some important changes with what I'm thinking of as a new midlife operating system so that you can be way more clear about what you want and how to get there, then I can totally help you create the success that you're looking for. That's why I created the Women in the Middle Academy with you in mind, because it's a warm, supportive, and fun coaching community of like-minded women who grow forward together so that you feel great about your future and you don't have regrets. So email me your questions and let's talk about it and see if it's a good fit for you. You can go ahead and book your free no obligation momentum call at www.womeninthemiddleacademy.com. For show notes and links, head over to www.susierosenstein.com and click the podcast tab and look for episode 309. And if you're interested in applying to be a guest on my new podcast, Women in the Middle Entrepreneurs, head over to www.midlifeinterviews.com and apply. Thanks so much for listening. It's time for you to put yourself first, one thought at a time. I'm Susie Rosenstein, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.